Hey beauties, welcome back to Aesthetic Chat with Kiki. I'm your host, Kiana Gamble, and this is the final episode of season four. So I thought it would be fun to have my husband, Ashwin, on the podcast because it is honestly very awkward to record episodes by yourself. And so I thought it would be fun for him to come on, share his business knowledge and advice with all of you. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, Ashwin, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell everyone who you are and what businesses you run. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me on the podcast. I think, you know, I've always heard you record these over the years, but I've never actually been able to sit in on one. So thank you. So a little bit about my background. I run a wealth management firm over here in Quarterly Idaho. We run a company called Mohan Financial, specialized with working with individuals and their families that work in big tech. So a lot of our clients are over on the West Coast in the Seattle area, down in the Bay Area as well. And then we also work with quite a few people over in Atlanta and New York. We also just started working with more business owners at various levels in their business. Um, that's been an ongoing thing for the past year and a half when we started implementing that. Outside of running Mohan Financial, I run a company called Mohan Coaching, where we really strive to educate younger and up-and-coming financial advisors on the importance of holistic financial planning. And then lastly, we run a little bit of real estate on our end. So managing properties and things like that as well, too. You're a busy man, Ashwin. (laughs) So the first thing I really want to address is I think that this podcast has evolved with me throughout this journey. And so one of those things obviously being that When I started the podcast, I had landed what I had thought was going to be the place that I died, essentially. I thought I was going to work there forever and then retire, and that was going to be it. But I think partway through, I had decided, you know, I think maybe I do eventually want to open my own practice. That was something that was never again on my radar when I started within this specialty. But as it kind of evolved, I was like, you know, I think maybe once I'm done with school, maybe I'll explore that as an option. Well, we're recording this podcast about a year, just coming up on a year after everything kind of went down. Fast forward, I ended up opening a practice far sooner than I anticipated. But I want to ask you. Like, what was running through your head right after I got that call and then immediately called you? Well, I think transparently speaking, you know, not just for me, but any spouse that gets a call finding out that their other spouse is no longer working at the job in the field that they love is extremely shocking. And when I got that call, you know, I was definitely surprised and it definitely caught off guard. I know it was you know, something that could potentially, you know, be a shift for you. And so finding that out just in the moment, I think it was in the moment, it was definitely a surprise, but I think in the long term, it definitely worked out. I think with a lot of individuals, they have these big ambitions and they want to do all these things, but they just, for lack of better terms, and hopefully I could get away with saying this, need a kind of kick in the ass. I think the nice thing is, is this was a really big dream of you wanting to start your own clinic and get that up and running. And, you know, I think it worked out really great. I think this was kind of the kick that you needed to start pursuing your dream. Yeah, as corny as it sounds, everything does happen for a reason. And being on the other side of it, it worked out in the exact perfect way that it was supposed to. I have grown so much. I've learned so much about myself, things that I can improve on, strengths, weaknesses. Like becoming a business owner has been a very like self-developing journey for myself. And again, I think looking back and now looking at where I'm at right now, I can say I'm actually really proud of what I've currently built and who I am right now. So I think that it's a really cool evolution of myself. But I want to go into the logistics of deciding to start my practice while I'm still in nurse practitioner school, what that kind of looked like. And so I think the first thing that I started to do was I spoke to other 
business owners in this space who also are in nurse practitioner school. I wanted to know in terms of time, feasibility, the amount of capital I would even need to run my own space. Was it possible? And so I want to just thank those people that I did reach out to because I reached out to four or five business owners and they took 30 minutes, hour, two hours with me, multiple phone calls to really break down what I needed to do, who I needed to talk to, and could I do this? And so they were really instrumental in helping me decide that, as well as talking to local reps in the area. I also want to thank Ashwin because he actually encouraged me to reach out to other people as well. So I talked to other business owners. They were like, you can absolutely do this go for it. And so I felt pretty empowered. I ended up deciding to completely invest in myself by liquidating my retirement accounts, taking all the savings that I had, and created my company, which is Natural Aesthetic and Wellness. So that was kind of the initial thoughts. I was able to open within three months of me leaving my former job like it was three months in a day we were open for business. So it felt like a whirlwind. But I do want to touch on the fact in deciding to run my own business, Ashwin was really helpful in me deciding if it was actually something I should do in terms of like my personality and my drive and those types of things. So babe, I want you to talk a little bit about the difference between an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. Because that was one of the big questions that you asked me was, do you want to run the ship or do you, you want to be a part of someone else's ship yeah so this was the really interesting thing when you started your business i didn't realize how similar our businesses were in different ways so you know really anything in the aesthetic space is sales you know, figuring out what's in the best interest of your client, positioning that to them, making sure your client does go ahead and gets that service or enrolls in whatever program that is designed. And one of the things that I coach financial advisors on, which is very similar to your field, is do you want to be an entrepreneur or do you want to be an entrepreneur? And the first question I ask people is, do you want to build the ship or do you want to actually go out there and be a part of a ship? And a lot of people out there when it comes to business say, hey, I really want to go ahead and build a ship, but they just don't have the passion, the vision, or transparently the work ethic to get it done. You know, I look at since you started your business, it's not a hey, nine to five thing. It's you see your patient, you do your school, you then go ahead and do client reach out, client follow up, do the ad campaigns, do everything. And fast forward, it's more than a nine to five. It's more like a nine to nine or call it a seven to 10. And so when you kind of take a look at everything that goes into building the ship, it's a lot more of a commitment. Yes, there is financial upside to it, but you have to ask yourself, are you willing to put yourself through the stress? Are you willing to put up with the ebbs and flows of running a business in order to really hit those benchmarks? Now, as an entrepreneur and, you know, being in the financial advising space, I've been both an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, the really cool thing about that is you get to be a part of something. You get to help it grow. You get to, you know, work and collab with other individuals to, hey, we want this thing to hit all these different metrics and hit these goals. We want to grow our practice. And a lot of people go, well, being an entrepreneur, I have a boss and I can't really have the flexibility. And I would challenge people on that. And the reason why I say that is because when you take a look at some of the biggest companies out there, most of these companies have phenomenal and very successful entrepreneurs. You know, Steve Ballmer and Microsoft worked as an entrepreneur alongside Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who were the founders of Microsoft. Perfect example of that. So before starting any type of business, whether it be in the aesthetic space, whether it be in sales, whatever it might be, that's the first question I would really ask yourself. Do you want to build this ship or do you want to be a part of it? And then really kind of take it from there. 
Great advice. And so the next thing that you recommended I do was to look into some free business courses to get some basic business knowledge. Because again, I think I've said it multiple times on this podcast and still have other guests. Healthcare individuals are not educated on basic business principles. I'm talking as basic as it gets, like gross versus net income. Like I was like, I really don't know the difference. And so Ashwin was like, go find some educational courses to where you can understand the basic business principles. Babe, do you have any recommendations for where they can find some of those courses or information? So one of the really cool things that our firm decided to start doing is we really started to build kind of more of a educational component to working with M. Mohan Financial. And what I mean by that is every member on our team has a different role, but there are certain characteristics and skills that each member needs to have because it will come up throughout their career. So one of the things that we just got enrolled in, we got our whole team on, and this isn't a sponsored ad. I feel like you have to say that now according to all the rules and whatnot, we started having everybody on the team watch a weekly masterclass video. So masterclass is really cool. You get a lot of different entrepreneurs, athletes, you know, professionals in their field that aren't entrepreneurs too. So the entrepreneur on their teaching different skills. So right now we're doing a whole segment in April, May on leadership and understanding, okay, how do you manage a team? How do you go ahead and train a team and make sure that we have great chemistry and great culture? You know, they have other stuff on there from business as well. You know, how do I run a P&L? How do I create uh, cash flow spreadsheets and kind of really take a look at that? I think the other big thing that I always encourage people to do is just take basic business classes. I can't remember, was it like UCLA or USC or? So I went through, I know you wanted me to do like the Stanford business course, but I only had a small gap between like school and things. So that wasn't really that feasible for me to do a full on business course, but I did like chunks of one. I can't remember exactly what program I went through. The quick trick to kind of look these up is you could just go into Google, type in free business classes, and you'll get a big, you know, kind of breakdown. I know the Wharton School of Business has a couple of free programs, a handful of our staff members did that as well. Then we also looked into UCLA, USC. I think there were one or two on there as well. But there's a lot of free resources out there. The other thing you could do, and I feel like this is extremely underrated right now, is go on YouTube. You know, you could type in on YouTube how to run a profit and loss statement, how to manage your books how to do taxes. And you're not really looking for the detailed understanding. Of course, definitely hire a professional to help you out with all these things. But it's good to have just a general understanding. You know, Mark Cuban said it best in his book, How to Run a Business or something along those lines. And I'm paraphrasing here. He said that you as a business owner want to have a basic understanding of accounting methods so that when you do sit down with your bookkeeper and your CPA, you know what they're talking about. So that's extremely important and something that I always recommend is finding things like that. And then you did recommend to me a few books to read as well in terms of getting in the headspace of an entrepreneur. So for those listening, do you have any specific book recommendations for them if they're interested in, you know, looking into opening their own practice? I have kind of my top five, and it's what I recommend to a lot of my coaching clients or even our clients. Usually my clients get a copy of these books. The first one is The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. talks about how to go ahead and manage your money, be really responsible with it, because as a business owner, your income's not going to be consistent, so you need to be very diligent on how you manage your personal finances as well as your business finances. I think from a big picture thinking, the magic of thinking big, 
is also a great book. Gets you to kind of think outside the box as well. The other two books I really like are actually by the same author, Ryan Sirhan, who is a real estate mogul, I guess you could call him. He runs a massive firm called Sir Hunt, has a bunch of one-off companies on there. He wrote three books. I'm reading his third one right now, but the two that I would recommend are How to Sell It Like Sir Hunt and Big Money Energy. And Sell It Like Sir Hunt was very impactful for our business back in 2021 when I first read it because it taught you the basics of sales how to build rapport with a client, how to get to know them, how not to, you know, try and go so product or service focused, but actually build a relationship. And then big money energy was cool because it got you to think a little bit big and take those same things and started to get those wheels kind of turning. My fifth and final book you actually read while we're dating was the 5am club by Robin Sharma. Most people, when they pick up a entrepreneur business book it sometimes could be really dry and so one of the things that i like about the way robin Sharma writes is everything's through narrative so he talks about all these different lessons through a story with three characters and whatnot and i think that's an extremely great book it's all centered around mindset i will say the 5 a.m club does not require you to wake up at 5 a.m i feel like that's a big misconception of the book but it is all about you know managing time being effective with that outside of books and i know i mentioned it earlier i would say definitely seeking a mentor you know you did a great job with that you had a couple different mentors that you chatted with the cool thing about your network that you built is you have a lot of people that you could just text and kind of pick their brain which is really cool and it's not just mentors in your field it's mentors in other fields so like a mentor in business versus a mentor in aesthetics i think you do a really good job of that thank you yeah i think that again going back to those people that i reached out to at the beginning and the ones that i can still reach out to now with a question whether it's an aesthetic related question a business-related question, a product-related question, building a network to where you can lean on other people. I would say that because my business model is, it's just me. I'm the person who greets you. I'm the person who does your photos. I perform the treatment and then I check you out and then you leave. It's a very boutique style. I think that doing a business in that way Come after I came from a very large practice where there were over 20 of us at the time, it can be very lonely if you don't have people to reach out to, to bounce those ideas off of, or to ask questions. I think that something that people don't talk about, or I haven't heard it talked about a lot, is doing things like this opening your own business, becoming more of an entrepreneur, it can be very lonely and a little isolating. So finding other people that can relate to you, I think is really, really important. So after you have decided, are you an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, you've read some more books, you feel like you have the capital, the mindset, all of these things that you should have in order to build a business. The next thing that Ashwin actually recommended I do was build a business plan. And honestly, I didn't really know where to start. So I Googled it, found a basic business plan, was able to complete it. But I think that what was nice about the business plan to put my thoughts down on paper and really define and then refine what my like mission and who I was selling to. I think it was funny because I remember you saying like, well, who is your ideal client? And me being naive, I'm like, what do you mean? Like I want all the, I'll take any client. And in thinking about it through the business plan and then having opened my space, I def, it's, I definitely want to be inclusive and try to service people and anyone who would love to come and see me. But you do have to determine who your client is because if you're trying to service everyone, that's where I think people start to flounder. What are your thoughts on that? We have kind of a three-step process to what to do after the entrepreneur thing. Business plan is definitely one of them. 
the first thing I would say is actually taking a step back and it's building your vision. You know, what do you want your business to look like one year from now, three years from now, and five years from now? And I think a lot of people get caught up in the excitement of, oh, I'm building the business, I'm doing this. But as you hit these different stages, you have to evolve and you have to figure out, okay, are we on the right path? If our goal is to hit X, are we on track to hit X or do we need to pivot? And so even as a business owner, that's been in business for nine years, you know, we have our, we have a 2030 vision for the team. We have a 2035 vision for the team as well. And we have a one, three and five year vision right now, or five year being 2030. And so having those visions are extremely important because it gives you good guidance on where you're going and it gives you direction from there. The next step would be building out that business plan and going, okay, what do I actually need to run my business? What is the stuff that needs to be in place and how do I go ahead and really kind of put that stuff together and really get that stuff done? And I think the thing that you did really well is once you got your business plan done, you started making your checklist and you're like, okay, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to get the space. I need to meet with different attorneys, different CPAs, bookkeepers. Like I need to get all my ducks in a row before I actually opened. And I thought that was extremely powerful on getting that stuff done. And then the third thing is your vision and your business plan combined are going to evolve and you have to keep on updating that. So one of the things I always recommend our coaching clients do every six months, so semi-annually, review the business plan, make sure you're on pace for the year, review the vision as well, make sure you're on pace for what you're trying to achieve on that timeline. And then if not, definitely pivot, but plan to rebuild your next business plan. So a business is kind of like a you know, for lack of better terms, like a baby, it's going to grow, it's going to evolve. And you got to keep on making sure that you're learning new things, you're investing in yourself, you're really helping yourself to really grow that. So at the end of every year, usually I like to do it between Christmas and New Year's. I'll take a full day out of the business that is limited to distraction and just sit down and get all my thoughts out. And I do that for each one of the businesses. So three businesses, three days. What do I need to do in each one? Who on my team is going to take on the tasks to get that done throughout the year? And then we go ahead and rebuild that out. As we are now hitting different metrics in our company and our company is taking off pretty quickly here, we are revisiting our business plan in June with the entire team. And we're saying, hey, this is what our vision is going to look like for the next six months to a year. This is what the next vision is going to look like for five years. This is what look like in 10 years. And the really cool thing about doing that is you get a lot of people bought in, especially when you're managing a team. So they're invested as well. There was something you said though, about clients that I really want to hit on real quick. So one of the things I always preach to business owners is the fishing pole analogy versus the fishing net. And what I mean by that is as a fisherman, you're going out there and you're trying to get one fish as, you know, on a fishing crew where you throw the net overboard, you're trying to catch as many fish and you got to decide, are you going to be a quantity person where you just want to get as many people in the door? Or do you want to be a specialist where you actually go work on with clients? So maybe you only have 200 clients that you manage, but they're high paying, high caliber clients rather than having 2000 clients. And they're great business models for both. It really just depends on what it is you want to do. I look at car brands and car guy. So if you look at car brands, high-end sports cars, their commercials aren't on TV. They aren't designed for that kind of clientele. They are very focused on a specific niche. And where they go and advertise is tailored to that specific niche. If you look at not high-end sports cars. So these are kind of the daily cars like your Honda and stuff. You see the commercials on TV. You see the advertisements on billboards and things like that. That is for the quantity. So you got to establish are you quantity or are you a specialist person? I think at the beginning, everybody's going to be a quantity person because you want to figure out who your targeted niche is within your field and what you want to offer them. And you just want to become the best person at that in the marketplace.
I think that that's a great point to touch on for sure. I do want to circle back because you had said that our businesses were actually very similar in the industries that we are in. And I think that for a long time, I actually thought this, like, I was like, no, we, we do not do the same thing. We, it's not the same. You can not compare them. But the more that I'm in the space of the business side of it, it's kind of crazy how similar most businesses are. We're just, again, selling or doing or providing a different type of service or treatment. And so I think it's actually been really, really helpful. I do think something that we should touch on is that we talked a little bit about how I seeked out other mentors, but when it comes to like our relationship, I never really wanted you to have a hand in my business. I always wanted to know all of the components of it and I wanted to run it myself. And so I always wanted to seek you more as a consultant and not someone that took care of the back end and I just injected and left. And so for those people listening and maybe they're in the same situation as us, right, where you have been in business for a long time and you have a lot of knowledge that you can help me with, what advice do you have for those couples that are trying to dance that line of helpful but not crossing the boundary and still I don't stay know. away from it just don't go <laughs> just don't go to no i'm just kidding i don't know it's you want to use your spouse as kind of like a sounding board we have quite a few friends where both their spouses run separate businesses some of their spouses run businesses together sometimes one spouse runs the business the other one doesn't and in your relationship with your spouse you want to use them more as a soundboard you know even for my businesses keon has brought a lot of great ideas stuff i haven't even thought about that i'm not an expert in and vice versa I don't even know how much skincare costs or any of that stuff. So I kind of just stay away from any recommendations or any help. I can give all the things that I don't know. But I always say, come to me when you need advice. Don't come to me and just say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what you're going to help me with. And it's this. It's, hey, I want to pick your brain on something. I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm kind of tossed between this. Which one should I do? And I'll give you my two cents, but at the end of the day, it's going to be your decision. Right there. It's your mm -hmm. business, and that's how you run it. So I would say that's really important. You know, some spouses have done a really good job kind of getting to the point with their businesses within the family, especially if you own multiple businesses. I've chatted with several business owners where one spouse has two or three businesses. The other spouse has two or three as well. My favorite two that I think do a really good job of this is Jesse Itzler and Sarah Blakely, I believe is her last name. Sarah founded Spanx, which she sold for a gajillion dollars. And then Jesse Itzler founded Marquee Jets. And both grew companies, both sold companies. They still run companies. They also have four kids, three or four kids. And they're super active, got a lot of stuff going on. And he did a talk at one of our conferences and he talked about that. And he said, you know, Sarah's great in her business. I'm great in my business, but there's going to be stuff that I want to pick her brain on. So I'm going to go and ask her. But Sarah doesn't know anything about marquee jets. She doesn't know about how much airplanes cost. I don't know anything about how Sphinx works. So, you know, it's great to just hear that difference in opinion and kind of get it out in the air and then just kind of get some feedback. And I would say that's really important to have in a household. I think that's great. And I do want to say that before I was a business owner, I don't think I really fully grasped what you were handling or what it really meant to always have something on your brain or always have something that could be done with the business. So for people that are interested in, you know, going down this route of becoming an entrepreneur, becoming a business owner, what do you say to them if they aren't surrounded by a bunch of friends that are business owners or their spouse isn't a business owner or the people around them just don't necessarily understand? What would you recommend they go and find 
people that are in the business space or how do you relate to like family and friends that just don't get it? This one's really tough, especially right now. I was actually chatting with uh, my business coach about it uh, a few weeks back. So in an area or I guess a community where there aren't a lot of business owners, it's really hard when you're starting your own business because you can't bounce ideas off of each other and have that sounding board that I was just mentioning. And if your spouse also doesn't have a business background or doesn't think that same way with that entrepreneurial mindset, that could also make it hard. So when you kind of think about ways to get out of this, you know, one thing that I found, and I say this, and I want to emphasize this, I say this with a lot of caution, is I started following a lot of big time entrepreneurs that I looked up to on social media platforms. And then all these entrepreneurs now have different coaching groups. And from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to test out different coaching groups to kind of see what's a good fit. You know, I personally have found that some entrepreneur coaches are a lot better than others. Some are just, you know, preaching a message that I don't think is the right message right there. So vetting out those communities is going to be extremely important for you. So when you kind of think about that, definitely finding groups and then also looking within your community, you know, finding a lot of entrepreneurs that are local to you, they're likely hanging out with other entrepreneurs. Business owners hang out with business owners. It's usually a tendency. I just think that is is because ideas and stuff just randomly keep on popping up and it's good to chat with somebody that could relate to that. So you'll slowly kind of get in there by finding other entrepreneurs within your community. And it's by going to things like networking events. Like that's the cool thing about being a business owner is you're always promoting your business. So you could go to that dinner. You could go to that charity event. There's a lot of other stuff that we do in the community that's helped us get to know more business owners. So by doing that and going to these events where they need sponsors that other business owners attend, that's how, one, you're going to get your name out there. Two, you're going to meet more people in that kind of a community and build better relationships. I think the last thing that I want to touch on goes back into school. So I'm in a three-year full-time program and I finish up, I am about a year from finishing now. I'll finish spring of 2025, but it's been a long time coming. School has definitely, at least my program, seems a little bit more involved than some of the other programs that are out there. This whole season really focused on different individuals' opinions and their experiences within NP school. And I really want to wait until I'm done with school to give you guys my final thoughts on my program and what I've learned and all of those types of things. But in the meantime, I think why we have Ashwin here, I think, what are your thoughts when it comes to being a supportive spouse, supportive significant other for someone that is going through starting their own business and is getting an advanced degree? I wouldn't necessarily pin it to an advanced degree, right? Because I think, you know, we don't have kids yet, but if you think about a mom, right? There's a really cool client of ours that runs a beverage company, and she's married. She's got a son, young son, really great clients, really good friends of ours. And one of the things that I picked up on her is she's got so much going on and everything. And her husband's great supportive, helping out, getting involved in the business. So I don't think it really matters if you're in school, if you're a parent, the most common one, but I don't think anybody talks about is having to work a nine to five while you create your side hustle on the back end. All of those things are things that are going to be going on usually in the background. And your spouse has to kind of be supportive about that. And if they aren't supportive about it, I feel like that's a conversation that needs to be had. I think a spouse should be supportive of anything that you want to do. But you know, what we did, and this was actually a really good thing, is before you started your business, we sat down and we said, okay, you got school going on. You got you want to start this business. You have a podcast. You have all this other stuff that we're doing in our lives to support my businesses and everything else. And I got the three companies. How do we manage all this? And 
when we did that, it kind of gave us a lot more clarity on, okay, what are we going to be doing? What's going to be priority? What's going to be taking a back seat? What's something that's going to be done over time? And so, you know, that was very important to have that communication. And then actually another question popped into my mind. I think everyone struggles with this. I think that you are great at reminding me of this as well. But for those people that are going to potentially embark on this journey, we talked a little bit about how it can be a little isolating. But let's talk about comparing ourselves to others and comparing success. I think that social media is a really easy way to portray a false narrative. Do you have any recommendations or advice for people that are entering this space? You know, they don't have a lot of capital. They're doing the best they can. They're doing the mundane things that are required to be successful, but you don't see the payoff in the moment. You really even don't expect to pay yourself in the first year of business at least. So how do you keep your confidence up? Because I think that that's something that I struggle with is keeping my confidence up as I go into more unknown scenarios and parts of my life. Yeah. So I think, you know, nine years ago, almost 10 years ago, when I started uh, in the financial services industry, Mohan Financial wasn't even created yet. It was just a thought in my mind. I was still wrapping up college. So I would work full time during the day. Then I would grab dinner. And then when I got done with the work, I would eat dinner and then sit in my cubicle and just do school and then work out in the morning and then just do it all over again, five days a week. And then Sundays were the days of catch up, you know, getting all the remaining stuff done, trying to figure out how I could get ahead and everything. And I did that for the first two years in business. Then in our field, there's advanced education, there's all these other things that you need to get done. I did that even for the next four years, you know, work during the day, studying for exams and everything else kind of at night and working on the actual business and stuff at night. Because, you know, as a financial advisor, when you get started, you got to put the sales side in, you got to put the business owner side. So when we moved to quarter lane, we were in a position where when we started Mohan Financial, the whole mindset was, hey, we've already reached a point in this business where this has been, you know, I think at the time it was seven years in the making. And we said, hey, now it's time to actually go execute on the vision because we built the skill set. We have the vision. We have the business plan. We have a whole strategy built out for it. And when we started, you know, Quarter Lane's not a big town. I think it was like a few hundred thousand people here or so. And, you know, there's a lot of other financial advising firms around and we're affiliated with a firm and there's a lot of other advisors in there and they've looked at us being in you know someone new off the street here walking into their office and frankly a lot of them were comparing their chapter you know three three years in the business to our chapter 10 and i tell a lot of people about that you can't compare what it is you're doing to what somebody else is doing. And I think in the young entrepreneur space, a lot of people get caught up in that, you know, especially in our field, a lot of people look at what we're doing. Like I'm before 30 and respectfully speaking, we're very honored for this, but we're one of the top advisors in the country right now. Um, And so being able to be in that position and really do that is really awesome. But it took nine years of a bunch of sweat equity put in. And so I always tell people, you know, don't look at people's chapter 10 as comparing it to yours and where you're at. Look at it as as inspiring and go, oh my God, that's where I want to be. You know, I had um, the opportunity a couple weeks back to fly to St. Louis and see the first foreign facility, massive company, you know, their vision very public about it is to be bigger than Nike one day. And I said, man, it would be great to build a financial advising firm that's as big as this one day. Well, those guys have, you know, 15, 20 years on me in business. And so I take a look at that and I go, oh my God, why am I not, why is my company not on the same caliber as theirs is, you know, eight, nine figures a year in revenue. And I go, well, we're just getting started. 
So I don't look at that company and view it as, oh my God, why am I not there yet? I look at it as, oh, that is awesome and badass on what they're achieving and what they're growing to. I want to go ahead and make moves and really grow towards that. Lastly, I want to say, if you have any questions about running a business, opening a business, or any questions about nurse practitioner school, whether it's resources or tips or anything like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. But Ashwin, tell everyone where they can reach out to you if they have any questions or maybe they want to make a leap and they want to get out of aesthetics and into financial services. Yeah, we're on quite a few different social media platforms, but Mohan Financial on LinkedIn, um, Mohan spelled M-O-H-A-N. You could also look me up on LinkedIn as well, Ashwin, A-S-H-W-I-N, Mohan on LinkedIn, and you could message me there. Instagram, we're on there. We don't use it as much, but it's just Ashwin J.B. Mohan. So feel free to go on there and DM me there. Happy to answer questions or put you in contact with an advisor on our team that might be able to help you get your business established and kind of build this out. All right, beauties. And that is a wrap on the final episode of season four. I want to thank all the guests for taking their time to record on the podcast this season. Again, none of these guests are paid. They are just doing it out of the goodness of their heart to share their advice with all of you. So again, I'm headed into my final like year of nurse practitioner school. My hope is to get season five released either by end of this year or early next year. And then once I am done with school, you can expect many more frequent episodes of the podcast and, you know, mini series. But until then, you can find the podcast at aestheticnursekiki.com. On Instagram, it's at aesthetic.chatwithkiki. My Instagram is at aestheticnurse.kiki. My practice is located in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It's called Natural Aesthetic and Wellness, and we are Natural Aesthetic and Wellness. On Instagram, website is naturalaestheticandwellness.com. So again, any questions, please feel free to reach out. But until next time, beauties. Bye.